I'm Stephen John Drew from the official GunnaGeek.com show, a weekly geek news podcast that is a part of the Gunna Geek Network, just like the show you're checking out now. Shows on the network are individually owned, and opinions expressed may not reflect others. Find other awesome geeky shows at GunnaGeekNetwork.com. <laughs> And welcome to Play Comics, the show where we look at video games based on comic properties and how well they stick to that source material. As always, I'm Chris, and today I'm really excited because after what feels like years and years of trying to get timing right, I have Josh Sutton on from Panels to Pixels. Josh, how are you today? I'm great. Thank you very much for having me. Better late than never. Oh, I know, right? We were, we were supposed to get this a full peek behind the curtain. We were supposed to get this going earlier. I was going to have him on for another episode. And then I sounded like deaf, so I had to reschedule. And then I freaked out because I needed an episode and accidentally gave the one he wanted away to somebody else. So I'm not perfect, no matter what anybody <laughs> thinks. But, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm hiding my resentment over that. <laughs> I'm just kidding. There's absolutely no problem. <laughs> The problem with time zones is trying to schedule these things all the time. I feel like I live a lot of my life on American time zones to collaborate with other people. Well, to be fair, time zones are stupid. Agreed. We're not here to worry about time zones today. We're here to talk about the tie-in for the 2003 Ang Lee Hulk movie, which I either watched for the first time or the first time in a very long time just the other night. It's, uh, you know... It's one of those formative experiences. You'll never forget your first time watching Ang Lee's Hulk. It's very interestingly shot, I think. Um, I don't want to get into a full film review podcast here, but there are definitely some things in there where they were trying to make it look kind of like a comic book as much as you can with a live action movie. And I appreciate the little details there. Yeah, and some of that stuff works better than others. I think overall it was a, a worthwhile endeavor. But yeah, I mean, some of it is kind of painful to look at. But, you know, they tried something. It definitely stands out. It's a very unique film, I would say. One thing that I thought was pretty unique about it was this is not a take on Hulk that I have seen in a lot of places. Granted, most of my Hulk reading has been the early 60s stuff when he first started and the current Immortal Hulk run. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm curious to see what you think about that, whether you think this is a traditional depiction of the Hulk, because I really feel like this is the most faithful to the original premise set out in the comics. That's my feeling on it. There are parts where, you know, it's certainly, yes, this is what I see as a traditional thing. You have Hulk worrying about getting angry you have him running around not necessarily knowing what's going on at the beginning trying to figure everything out um i mean you don't really have him worrying about time of day and switching over at night but i don't think any of the movies ever touch on that because that's just weird i think the modern audiences yeah i mean okay full cards on the table for listeners i absolutely adore this film <laughs> It's, uh, I made a video about it uh, a few months ago, about six months ago, um, and in it I kind of hypothesized that it's, it's a tr it, audiences dis like found disagreements with it because they want in they wanted a summer blockbuster, a superhero movie, whereas what it actually is is closer to like an old school monster movie, like a Frankenstein or or you know Jekyll and Hyde is the obvious parable, uh, and and I really feel like it lives up to that and uh, and then adds in all the kind of the complex kind of psychological um, uh, drama and and well I made a whole video about it about trauma and abuse and and depictions of masculinity and things like that I think it's a really really deep uh, complex film and I think it's often overlooked and I think that's a shame 
obviously we'll have a link down to that video in the show notes. I purposely stayed away from watching that video because I wanted to form my own opinion, especially knowing that I was going to be watching it so close to recording this. And I don't not hate the movie, but it's certainly not what I was expecting. Yeah. And do you know what? Because uh, I had to rewatch it a lot for that video. So I, I really do feel like it's, um, you know, when I close my eyes to go to sleep at night, I see Ang Lee's green rubbery Hulk. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, especially in the kind of post MCU world, it really is is quite a breath of fresh air. I feel like I think it's good that it's not what you're expecting. I really feel like I should have watched some of the trailers for this one before I watched the movie just to get myself in the right mindset because I was definitely kind of in that Mark Ruffalo MCU mindset going into this even though I knew he wasn't anywhere near the movie. I knew this was the Ang Lee one that everybody has opinions on. It's just it's hard for me to break out of that MCU mindset with something that's so close time-wise to when the MCU happened. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And and even the Ed Norton, the first MCU Hulk, kind of retreads some of the same ground as this, but but kind of makes it a bit more... Uh, polishes it up into a more mainstream film, I would say. In fact, uh, one of the things Ang Lee said about this film when, he, when it was first released was that it was the most expensive indie movie ever made. And I definitely think those kind of like... You know, even the pace of it is so slow and meditative that you definitely get some of that indie movie sensibilities in it. That's definitely one thing we picked up on watching it because Kaylee was watching it with me like she usually does with this kind of thing. And she was kind of waiting for stuff to happen. And I, mean, I was too, honestly. It's Hulk. I expect him to run around punching things. <laughs> yeah. That's true. And, you know, we'll get into this when we start talking about the game, but uh, I think people took similar umbrage with the game for the same reason. Not enough punching things. So the way the movie starts out, um, they take the Hulk origin away from that original 60s one, and instead Bruce Banner's dad is doing some experiments and ends up passing the experiment on to his son because genetic mutations and things and science that goes above my head. Oh, I mean, whatever, that's just this weird science thing that I can accept in a superhero movie. And then when there's a giant gamma atomic blast, leaves Bruce out under a kitchen table to get blasted. <laughs> yeah. This, uh... This... I don't know how deep you want me to go into the the comic origins of that, uh, but in the you know Peter David, a legendary Hulk writer, he he kind of sowed the seeds for some of that origin stuff by suggesting that Hulk was uh, kind of hereditary, not solely uh, due to the accident that he has in the lab. It could be more of a genetic thing. I'm glad that there's something there. I mean, one of the things that I picked up on was the notes during the opening credits it said something about how regeneration equals immortality and after reading the immortal hulk run up to i think like 35 if my numbering is right at least for when we're recording just the idea there is that hulk might die but he keeps coming back to life and that's not something I'd seen in the other MCU movies at all. So seeing that picked up here in a comic run that doesn't start for somewhere close to 10 years, I think was really interesting and really makes me wonder if Al Ewing has seen this movie. I mean, I'm sure he has, but how much of an influence this movie ended up having on him. Yeah, I think it, it all comes back to that horror uh, element of the character which can sometimes you know comes in and out i would say that the mcu version has really done away with the the horror side of it but immortal hulk i think the the appeal of that book and why it's been so popular is because it's got back to those like old monster movie roots uh, of the hulk you know the 
Incredible Hulk issue one from the 60s says on the cover, is he man or monster or is he both? I've always really loved that line and that's the, um, I think one of the the storylines in the Immortal Hulk is called, is he both or something? Well, I don't remember. <laughs> but it's definitely referencing those early horror origins of the character. So you were mentioning something about uh, Peter David and what he had thrown in there. That seems like something really interesting to me. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm actually sat with the so much do I love this film that I have the official novelization, which I pulled off my bookshelf to flip through for notes. <laughs> and it was written by Peter David. And uh, so that's kind of the, the, uh, the snake eating its tail of this is that the film kind of pulls a lot from his writing and he ended up writing the novelization of the film uh but yeah it definitely his whole thing when he was writing it in the 80s and early 90s is that he tried to make it uh you know more of a psychodrama and and more about bruce banner's split personality and trying to make the hulk and bruce banner these two distinct personalities but they they're all one within bruce banner um and they're all a result of in fact, he, he split it up into into multiple personalities. He had like Professor Hulk and things like that, um, and Joe Fix it. But it was all about, um, you know, these distinct personalities are all the results of different traumas that Bruce has experienced through his life, not just the the being exposed to gamma radiation, um, but also you know childhood abuse and uh, and you know other things like that, which works its way into the movie. You could definitely tell in there that Nick Nolte, as Bruce's father, is not going to win Parent of the Year anytime soon at all. <laughs> no, definitely not. He really goes for it. That's like, um, you know, everybody else is, is doing very muted performances, and he just goes full Hamlet with it. He's, uh, he's chewing scenery left, right, and center. But it works. It really works. He's a comic book villain in that film. I mean, if anybody has seen the Nick Nolte mugshot, if you've seen it, you know exactly what I'm talking about. This movie is why he looked like that. <laughs> yeah, he's the very definition of a wiry man. And I can't go through the beginning here without saying that this is the second time Jennifer Connelly has been in a movie with a based on a comic that got a game that it gets covered. That is always nice because I just like her as an actress. Just remind me, what's the uh, the first? The first one we covered was The Rocketeer. Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, that's a great one. She's had a good track record, I would say, then, compared to a lot of uh, comic book movie actors and actresses. I'm Honestly, I'm still trying to decide what I think of this movie. I know you're going to convince me that it's amazing, and I should love it and sing its praises off the rooftops. I think that it might just suffer from me seeing the other ones first, and I will inevitably always compare it to those. Sure. And I think that has a lot to do with it. Like, I'll, I'll be honest, I was the perfect age for this film when it came out. I was just turning 11 when this film came out, and uh, this, this more than any other superhero film during my life, has... Um, you know, I was fully on board with it. I rode the, the hype train. I had full full kitted out bedroom with Hulk posters and pajamas and big fists and action figures and every piece of merchandise you can imagine. Well, I was turning 17 and you have just made me feel old. <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> I was in that awkward part where I didn't really have a car where I could drive around to get things and I didn't want my parents to drive me around all over the place. And I just never got around to seeing this when it came out. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I'm thinking... So, when I was in my late teens, that was when the... Hang on, is this right? What year is it now? 2020? Yeah, so when I was in my late teens, that was when the MCU was starting up. And... Um and a lot of kind of what I consider to be the, the pits of uh, superhero movies. You know, you had like Spider-Man 3 and, and things like that. And uh, I don't have a lot of emotional attachment for those things because I was too busy being a teenager to really experience those at the time. It's only in hindsight I've gone back to experience them. So I definitely think it's an age thing. You're kind of... 
Just that whole thing, like your your favorite era of sci-fi is the age that you were eight years old. That's what everybody says. So. Yeah, that seems about right. So, what made you love Hulk so much? Because I know that you're not just randomly picking this movie to make a giant video about. Yeah. Um, well, as a kid, it was that it was just this like, you know, roller coaster of rage. Uh, just this like, you know, it's like the ultimate power fantasy. He's the one you always want to see the other heroes go go up against. You want to see Spider Man fight the Hulk, and you want to see, you know, Iron Man go up against the Hulk, uh, or Wolverine go up against the Hulk, because he was like, you know, the guy. <laughs> Um, so that's, that was the appeal as a kid, but then as I've got older, I've started to appreciate the stuff uh, that this movie was really trying to highlight, which is, you know, the uh, the anger side of it and the the way that he, that Bruce is afraid of of the Hulk and he's afraid of his emotions and the ways that he deals with that. Uh, you know, he might become more withdrawn or he might you know emotionally numb himself to deal with those things and i think there's so much interesting kind of mental health stuff around the hulk which i go into into the video i made about it um and i won't bore you with too much here but um yeah i think he's a really complex character and deceptively complex because on the surface as i said and when you're a kid you're only really looking at the power of it and the destruction and the carnage um but then I think Bruce Banner, as I've got older, has become the more interesting character than the Hulk. And I, he's, you know, absolutely one of my favorite fictional characters of all time, up there with Spider-Man and, you know, whoever else, Darth Vader. I, mean, I love that you brought up the mental health stuff, because that's really kind of what kicked me into my Hulk gear myself. Uh, Kaylee and I were randomly watching Agents of Smash because it was on and we could and, you know, why not? And I always forget if it was that or the Avengers cartoon that went with it. But there was an episode there where Hulk and a few other people were trapped by the leader and they all had the worst parts of them brought out. Whereas Hulk basically didn't because he that's something that he deals with every day anyway so that's just something that really connected with me of you know here's first banner having to deal with this hulk monster keep it in check make sure that he stays safe while he deals with this monster inside of him i related it to uh depression stuff and then hulk became my guy yeah yeah definitely and again that's something i talk about in the video is is i relate to it so much on a mental health level um and i kind of you know surmise that it's not just about anger that anger is one emotion of many that the hulk represents and that's the, at the superficial level he's a character who's all about rage but it's it's also so many different kind of negative emotions let's say um and it's all about, you know, the very fact that, that as the Hulk, he becomes more childlike um, is is about that kind of emotional regression and regression to a point where you can't process emotions as well. And I think that that kind of is what happens when you fall into a depression or you, you know, become angered by something or whatever. It's these kind of primitive emotions taking over. Um, and, 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 you know... Although the the roots of it are in the comics, in Peter David's comics, about the Professor Hulk and Smart Hulk, that's something I've, I could never really get on board with in the MCU because it kind of goes against everything that appeals to me about the character to the point where, you know, it's a completely separate character and, and I can't really relate to that, that version. Well, we're going to go try to get ourselves into a better headspace after that while we drop some promos <laughs> for a few other shows. Everything's fine. Everything will be fine. Everything is fine. Everything's fine. Oh, everything is fine. Everything's fine. Everything's fine. Everything is fine. Everything is not fine. 
Diary of a Space Archivist. The comedy sci-fi drama about family chocolate and space. Do not be alarmed. Everything will be fine. Monkey Tales, starting in December from Monkey Man Productions. It's a monthly ongoing series of one-shot episodes with settings ranging from fantastic other worlds to possible futures to the very real and everyday. What am I supposed to be looking at? Everything. Everything? The sky, the stars, just look. Do you think your mom is jealous because you went out into space space and she's on the moon? Nah, -uh. not me, you. Deepest secret. Monkey Tales is Hope Punk, an optimistic positive take on storytelling where love and resistance don't just light a candle against the darkness, they light a bonfire. Where we win the day by building connections and communities. Where we find hope and use the tales we tell to spread that around. Big auditions, smaller auditions. Finally, I couldn't even make the list. Things were starting to get dire when Superman saved me. I hope you're intrigued by what you've heard. You can add us to all your podcast apps now. Watch out for monthly episodes beginning December 9th. And we'll go on some hope punk adventures together. I truly can't wait. Those are some great shows you should check out, but first let's finish up with this one. So Josh, uh, you look at a lot of video game tie-in movies, I'd imagine. Yes, uh, my shelf is overflowing with terrible movie tie-in games. Why have you done this to yourself? <laughs> um, well, I mean, it comes from comic books, really, and my love of comic books, uh, and and wanting to play in those worlds. You know, I grew up, particularly the I collect Marvel games. I've got, uh, you know, more than I can count, to be honest. Um, but it's as a kid, the appeal of that was always like, okay, the Marvel universe. I've read about it. I've seen it on films, but I want to be in it. I want to experience it. Um, and that's really what the best games, the best superhero games, offer you. So then enter this 2003 in North America and Europe, 2004 in Japan game where they made the decision to have the storyline take place like eight years later. Whether it was good or not is entirely up to you. Yeah, ostensibly it takes place eight years after the game. After the film, I mean. But it kind of goes against my reading of the end of the film at least so whenever I play this game I kind of interpret it as you know maybe an alternative universe or a, a side pull from the film oh good I'm glad I'm not the only one because it, it definitely doesn't make sense to me um, I don't want to spoil the end of the movie but I don't see how it gets into this game at all and I'm just going to leave no. it at that yeah I mean, it would, it really, uh, it kind of disregards everything that happens in the movie on like a spiritual level. Uh, yeah, again, not to get too into it, but you know, the the character arc of Bruce in the in the movie. Well, at the start of the game, he's he's the character from the start of the film, so he he's regressed some somewhere in those eight years. So you have this game for Radical Entertainment and Universal Interactive. I don't believe we've looked at anything from Universal Interactive on here at all. I know we've looked at something from Radical. Radical are best known for Ultimate Destruction, another Hulk game. And then um, the Prototype series. And uh, Simpsons Hit and Run. That's a game that I'm very fond of as well. And as far as the context of this show, they worked on Speed Racer in My Most Dangerous Adventures. Ah. Yeah. That's the only one we've looked at so far, although a lot of people have asked me about Ultimate Destruction. Yeah, and that's kind of considered the, the high watermark for Hulk games. Uh, but I would argue that this game does certain things better than Ultimate Destruction. But again, a lot of that's nostalgia on my part, because as I said, you know, I, I had all the merchandise for this movie, and that includes the tying game and the, the copy that I have is the same copy I've uh, <laughs> kept with me for, for oh God, for 17 years now. Man, that's always nice when people can hold on to their stuff. The storyline for this game is weird. Yeah, definitely. 
I mean, no, I, I think it's fair to say that it, it doesn't matter. It, you know, you can treat it as a alternative. You know, it's it's the same world as the movie, but it's not. It, you know, it has nothing to do with the events of the movie. I like to think of it more as it happens during the movie, maybe. Yeah, or even before. I mean, oh no, it couldn't happen before. But like, a, yeah, like a sequel, um, because there are there's there's you know Betty Ross is in the game, and you know although there isn't much time devoted to their relationship in the game, it kind of uh, lines up with their relationship at the midpoint of the movie rather than at the end of the movie where their relationship would be very different. But you also have a character in the game, Doctor Crawford, who says that. that he has made a cure for Hulk being the Hulk. Not something that I would want if I was the Hulk, but I, I can imagine where people would be making that kind of thing. Yeah, that's. I mean, that's actually a reoccurring plot point in a lot of Hulk stuff and uh, and games as well. Oh, isn't that the, that's the whole thing in the the first MCU Hulk movie? Uh, I forget the the Doctor's name. But it's, the whole thing is that he's he's got a cure for the Hulk, and he's you know sending him encrypted messages, uh, like similar to how this this uh, game starts out. He's getting encrypted messages from this Doctor Crawford, telling him that the Gamma Orb is the answer to all his problems, and he's going to cure him once and for all of this terrible affliction. See, the problem with this game, this is one where I I only got to play it for a little bit. I was mostly watching gameplay videos because. I don't personally own this one, and it took me a while to find a way to play it, and I'm just going to leave it like that. <laughs> and I mean, from watching gameplay videos, though, it, it doesn't look like there's a lot of development of your character over the course of the game. No, there's really not. It's, uh, I mean, it feels like it all takes place over 12 hours and there's there's not much to it really story wise it's just a scenario it puts you in a scenario uh with a host of comic book villains that don't feature it in the film and and it kind of just lets you loose i'm glad you brought that up because a lot some of these villains are ones where Yes, I, I mean, I could name them, and anybody who is pretty familiar with Hulk will know who they are. And then there's some other ones where I doubt that people would really know, so interesting to me that they would make them as bosses in this game. Yeah, I mean, Hulk's Rose Gallery is not the greatest. <laughs> it's kind of a lot of uh, kind of C, D, E, F, G listers. Uh, you know, and the kind of the the headline acts of those have all featured in the films, really. You know, you've got uh, the leader who is in the game, and then you've got Abomination, who isn't in the game, uh, but has been in virtually every other Hulk game. And that's it, really. I have no idea why he's not in this. It makes no sense to me. Yeah, and actually, it kind of makes me wonder... When I was working on my video about the film, I learned a lot about the production and how rocky the production was, and how up until the 11th hour they were still making changes to the script. And for anybody who's seen the film, they'll know that the the, the kind of the big bad of the film is Nick Nolte's character, who is an amalgamation of many different Marvel characters. He's Bruce Banner's father, um, but he's also has the properties of the Absorbing Man who was in an original draft for the movie of the script. Um, and it, it almost makes me wonder if this game was being developed as changes were being made and if there were certain characters that they weren't allowed to use, like Abomination, like Absorbing Man. Um, and, and they had to create a wholly kind of unique story. And that's why it doesn't line up with the movie in any way. Like you think the studio told them they shouldn't use those characters or 
they decided the studio has no idea what they're doing. We're going to make sure that whatever we're making isn't going to be affected by changes. Uh, possibly a little from column A and from column B. <laughs> but no, I mean, usually the way these things go with license games is if a movie's coming out, they say, don't put anything in here that's going to contradict what we're doing. Uh, you know, or confuse the, the branding or anything like that, you know. They don't want to mix the messaging around the film, so just just steer clear of anything that happens in the film. That's the way it sometimes happens. Other licensed games are very faithful adaptations of the of the, the movie, and sometimes you can get cool bonus things which turn out to be stuff that was in the original script that was taken out. I would wager that in this case they were told don't hit any of the plot points from the movie but something we haven't talked about is that uh eric banner who plays bruce banner in the movie is voicing the character in this game which is unusual for the time to have a uh you know the movie actor do the voice and it definitely adds some authenticity it does make it feel like it's part of the same world i think that's a nice touch i also think it's a nice touch that they went with the cell shaded graphics because this era of games was not exactly really pretty. Yeah, and it looks really nice. It, it's aged really well, this game. Those like almost cell shaded graphics, kind of like posterized colors, like limited uh, color palette. I'd say this is a high quality game for the time and for, the, for a time when movie licensed games often weren't very high quality. The common narrative really is that movie tie-in games are always crap. And I mean, just look at the Batman game for NES. That is definitely not crap, and it's a movie tie-in game. Yeah, 100%. That's one of my favorite. That, that is my favorite NES game and one of my favorite superhero games of all time. And yeah, I mean, I kind of feel that the, and I talk about this a lot on my channel, the, the golden age of these kind of movie tie-in games is over now and we'll never see games like this you know for every horrible you know absolute you know this is a pg show as you told me so i'll <laughs> i'll steer clear of any bad language but for all the awful movie games there were some that slipped through the net and and they were clearly made with passion and and you know knowledge of the source material um and and that's that doesn't happen anymore because the the ips are so closely guarded you know i mean as we're talking the a new avengers game has just come out featuring the hulk and i would say without getting too much into that one of my criticisms of it would be that that property has been too micromanaged by the IP holders, which wasn't happening in 2003 because they weren't seeing as much value in the Hulk in video games. You know, it wasn't a multi-billion dollar prospect. So Radical Entertainment were given free reign to kind of do whatever they wanted, as long as they set it, tie it into the film. And, and then as with this, as with Spider-Man 2, as with um, Wolverine Origins, as with Batman on the NES, you end up with games that are diamonds in the rough. They just get it right. One of the things I find really interesting with this game is that I got home and while we were eating dinner, I pulled up a couple reviews on YouTube because I like to watch those right before I record just to make sure I have stuff fresh in my head and everything. And usually like for cartridge games and stuff there's a couple people i watch where they kind of like the same stuff i like so i always go and find them because i know that i can follow their logic on everything and it's getting to the point where i can't find those guys anymore because they just stop doing games around this era so i randomly pick two reviews to watch and one person absolutely hated the game every single thing possible was this sucks this sucks i hate it why did they do this and the next one that popped up was yeah i'll admit maybe it's nostalgia for me but i really like this game and i feel like that kind of thing goes with the movie too because i know a few other people besides you who enjoy the ang lee hulk movie but it seems like people either really like the movie like you seem to 
or think it is a complete dumpster fire that needs to just go get thrown into the sun. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, that's the internet for you. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's kind of funny the, the I kind of alluded to it earlier, but the game, I would say, polarized people in a similar way to the film. And for kind of vaguely similar reasons, because I think one of the big criticisms about the game is the Bruce Banner sections. So, uh, you know, there are the Hulk sections that you would expect, where you're you're beating things up and crushing things and just killing people. Uh, and, and they control really well. They're really, really nice, fun. The Ultimate Destruction, you know, they're kind of, you know, Ultimate Destruction was kind of a sequel to this game. And that's like the best Hulk game. So all of that is is here in this game's DNA. But then there's the Bruce Banner sections where the pace comes down. There's largely stealth sections with puzzle aspects and some kind of light kind of puzzle platforming and things like that. And um, yeah, I think people find those frustrating and they find them jarring. Like all the action comes to a dead stop when you get to the to the Bruce Banner sections. And there are a lot of those sections in the game. Uh, for me, I really appreciate those sections because I think, as I was saying earlier, that dynamic between Bruce and the Hulk is so essential to the character. And, you know, if you're looking for a Hulk game that isn't just mindless violence and you're looking for something that really gets to the heart of the character, I think this is definitely the way to go. And I think this was the first... Uh, well, I was going to say it's the first game that allows you to play as Bruce Banner, but actually The Incredible Hulk on... SNES and Mega Drive had you transform into Bruce when your health got depleted. But for all intents and purposes, this is the first, you know, that had you play as Bruce in a meaningful way. And, you know, it actually kind of reminds me of uh, Spider-Man PS4. Uh, the Peter Parker, Peter Parker sections in, in that game and the puzzle sections are kind of set out and paced very similar to this game and when that game came out people had the same kind of criticisms this slows the game down all i want to do is play spider-man and swing around but i think if you're going for a deeper interpretation of the character it's kind of essential you know that's what marvel superheroes is all about it's about the human side it's the the human part of the superhero rather than just the non-stop action And that kind of thing is why I really love that I've gotten into comics anyway. You know, if, if I wanted to just go watch people fight all the time, then I could have, you know, watched some really horrible kung fu movies where they're just made to fight all the time or something. I like the humanity brought to the characters. Yeah, for sure. And and this is something I've said before is that. Well, when Spider-Man was coming out, people were saying, you know, all they've got to get right is the web swinging. That's number one priority. But if I open up a Spider-Man comic, I don't want to read 22 pages of Spider-Man swinging around a city. You know, there's so much more to the character than than the action. And, uh, you know, you know, it's it's a different thing with games because you have to have engaging gameplay. Uh, and maybe the Bruce Banner sections in, in Hulk aren't terribly engaging. Although I do find the puzzles, the you know, you have to do code breaks um, and, you know, it's kind of like matching pairs to, to break codes to hack into computer terminals and things like that. I actually find those quite fun and, uh, and quite relaxing. They'd be more relaxing if there wasn't a 20 second timer on them. Sometimes that gets a bit down to the wire. Uh, but yeah, I, I think this game gets so much right about the character. I really do. So, I mean, that really leads right into the set of questions I ask at the end. You know, what, do you, what do you think are like your top two or three things that this game gets right, both compared to the film and Hulk in general? Ooh. Um, I mean, yeah, I've kind of covered a lot of it. I will say that, um, you know, there isn't a lot of story in this game, and there isn't even you know a great amount of dialogue or or anything happening <laughs> it made me laugh i actually uh, played through this game again uh, in preparation for this and i was kind of surprised by when you get to the end the end cutscene is really nothing it's like two lines of dialogue and and a little montage of of kind of what happens next but it's so you know really uh, inconsequential um the ending of this game so although it kind of you know there's there's not a terrible amount of story going on 
it does bring in some of those you know uh deeper meanings from the movie you know right at the beginning you have a dream sequence and you have uh, one of the, the it kind of recreates a scene from the movie which i really love which is the hulk smashing through the mirror and grabbing bruce and that's such a strong image um and really with no words that tells you so much about the things that we've touched on the 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 two sides of bruce's personality and the fear and the trauma and you know always keeping that monster locked behind a closed door and and being afraid of it smashing its way out so so that's one thing it gets right did you ask for three (laughs) i was just trying to limit you really yeah, because I could go on for hours. <laughs> it's a good job to limit me. Yeah, I think the, the Hulk gameplay is really, really good and uh, way more in-depth than, than it needs to be, especially for the time. You know, you can really get some interesting combos. You can you can do the thunderclaps. Uh, you know, you can pile drive your enemies into the ground. You can pick up enemies. You can throw them. You can pick up objects, use them as projectiles or melee weapons. You can string combos together. There's a rage meter that fills up and then all your your attacks become more powerful it's you know it's really good stuff and it feels really good it's really satisfying to play so that's number two and the third thing it gets right is the just the general aesthetic of it you know the cell shaded graphics look really good it's aged really well the cutscenes are well animated uh it has a really consistent mood to it the music is fantastic i i uh, yeah if you can't tell already, I'm a big fan of this game. <laughs> I mean, the main thing for me, it honestly, is the fact that you have to play as Banner. I mean, like you said, the, the Super Nintendo and the Genesis one, if you're over on this side of the water, you, you don't ever really want to play as Bruce because that means you're about to die. But here, you get into that Bruce character and the other aspect of who that Hulk Bruce combo is. And I think that that's just something that's really important to the character as a whole. And I really like that they found a way to represent that. Yeah, for sure. And it's, you know, you have to enter a different mindset when you become Bruce because you're not all power. You you know, you have to be sneaky. You have to be stealthy. All the things that you don't really have to be concerned with at all as the Hulk. So what do you think this game really gets wrong? Um, well, one thing that's always kind of puzzled me about it is that you can run past most encounters. You can get through this game in, in about an hour and a half if you just don't fight the enemies. Um, you can literally just, particularly early on in the game, it's kind of, you go from arena to arena and and waves of enemies just, you know, wail on you. Um, but as far as I can tell, those enemies are just spawn infinitely, and it gets to a certain point where you can kind of, you know, you get sick of beating up the same team of four, you know, armed henchmen over and over again, and you try to leave the arena and realize that you can, and you could have the whole time, and and yeah, you, you don't even have to fight. But I was thinking about this earlier, and I was thinking, you know, that could be a criticism of the game because there are really no stakes there, but also. If you were the Hulk, maybe you would flee conflicts like that. Um, you know, maybe you can play this game as semi-pacifist and, and not fight and be on the run and be the persecuted kind of Frankenstein's monster kind of a thing. So I don't know if that's a criticism, but it is a puzzling, from a game design point of view, it's a, it's a weird decision to not, you know, make you fight the enemies you're going up against. That's something I didn't even realize because it's just ingrained into me that when an enemy shows up on the screen, you have to fight them. Yeah, and I was having to fight that instinct because, you know, as I said, I, I replayed it uh, to talk about it, and uh, and I realized, you know, I, I can get through this game a, a lot quicker. But I was I kept forgetting that, and so I would enter a new area and I would start fighting them, and then remembering, oh yeah, I don't have to do this. I can just run past them, and, and nothing happens. <laughs> So if you had somebody who wanted to get into Hulk, would you hand them this game as a bit of a primer course? Ooh, probably not. Because I do recognize, you know, a lot of it is nostalgia for me. Um, And I don't know if this would be... I mean, if it was specifically a video game that I wanted to give someone, I would give them Ultimate Destruction. Uh, Because that's kind of, you know, 
that's universally acclaimed for a reason that really does get to the heart of the character uh but you know i would give someone a comic before i gave them a video game i think i don't know if i would say that this game is a horrible introduction or even a bad introduction there's certainly better ones but i mean there's certainly a lot worse things you could hand them as well so i don't think this is the worst move you could make no but it's also very specific uh in its interpretation of the hulk much like the movie so you know as a as a primer for someone who's new to the character who maybe wanted to get a broad spectrum of what the character's about this would not be the way to go and let's be real if somebody wanted to get into the hulk i would just go tell them to go grab the immortal hulk trades and read yeah i mean that in itself is also very specific take on the character uh i kind of wondered about that i've actually i'm not very far into that series that's when i put the video out um about the hulk everyone told me you need to read this you're going to love this it touches on so many of the themes that you've talked about so i went and bought the omnibus and i'm not very far into it uh so but so far i'm thinking wow this is certainly a take on the character it's although it references the early origins of the character and it references some of that peter david stuff it's doing something wholly original that doesn't really align with i would say the general view of the character i just love it that i want everybody to read it anyway <laughs> yeah definitely it's one of the reasons why i have a pull list yeah i mean without getting too much into the state of modern marvel comics if if not for a mortal hulk and a few other titles you know i don't think i would be as engaged as i am in modern comics so Josh, it's been great having you on. If people want to hear more from you, where else can they find you around the internet? Yeah, so the primary place the primary place to find me is YouTube. So just search panels to pixels or head to youtube.com slash panels to pixels. And there you'll find, you know, all my musings about all things comic books, video games, uh, 90s superhero cartoons. That's something I'm known for, for talking about. Uh, and, you know, other fun things like that. Mainly things from my childhood and things that I feel emotionally attached to. Or you can follow me on Twitter, at panels to pixels I don't do Instagram, really, or Facebook, but on Twitter I tweet a lot of garbage. <laughs> and sometimes some good things. As always, we'll have links to that kind of thing down in the show notes. Because, you know, just in case you forget how to spell words, like I do all the time, you can click a link. It's so much easier. And you're probably already listening to this on your phone, so you can just go look at the show notes that are right there, and boom, link to the website. You're good to go. You know, just like always, if you want to follow me around on the internet, you can head on over to Twitter at PlayComicsCast. You can head on over to the Play Comics website, which has links to the Facebook group, the Discord channel over on the Gunna Geek server, because Play Comics is a part of the Gunna Geek network. And if you want to go check out other wonderfully geeky shows, you can do it over there. If you want to help support the show hear these episodes early i'm still trying to figure out the timeline on how early sometimes it's the day before sometimes it's a week before i don't know it just kind of depends on when i get it done you can go over to patreon search for play comics and anything above the dollar level you'll get the episodes whenever i happen to get them done instead of ridiculously early sunday morning eastern time when i schedule them to come out if you like the music that we're rudely talking on top of right now head on over to soundcloud.com slash best dash day to check out best day's music but most of all, just grab a game, grab a stack of comics, and go find yourself a new favorite character. So you have this game for Radical Entertainment and Universal Interactive. Um, I don't believe we've looked at anything from Universal Interactive on here at all. Um, I know we've looked at something from Radical, and why didn't I think to have this pulled up before? Hey, so for the people who listen through the end, the reason why I tag things the way that I do is so that I can randomly pull up games while we're recording.